to a great extent, this discussion was very much Thomas' ideas. So this is why I'll go with Thomas, because for the last year, both of us kind of uh, have written a book trying to reflect on the last 30 years as a result of it hoping to know something for the next 30 years. And because the idea of the Westlessness, obviously there is a different interpretation. I do believe that Westlessness probably is something between the Wild West and the Wellness Club. <laughs> so we should try to find it out where it is. So Thomas, it's you. <laughs> Thank you, Eva, and thanks to MSC for allowing us to be here. Thank you for coming, uh, and we're certainly more in, in the Wellness Club department here. So, uh, um, what I wanted to—I've I've altered what I wanted to say, having listened into two days of MSC about Westlessness, and so many people talked about the West in in these last 48 hours that I thought I'm gonna sort through that a little bit and put that into at least my context. Now we've heard, and by the way, the claims that were made about the West are wildly different, uh, sometimes contradictory, going into all kinds of, they are all across the board. So there was, for example, uh, the German defense minister, AKK, Annegret kramp karrenbauer Now to her, uh, she wants to defend the West. Uh, and to, uh, to her, the West is an idea. Uh, an idea about human rights, human dignity, uh, liberal democracy, and she says that idea is attractive. It fascinates people. Then there was Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, uh, who says the West is even winning. Winning. But the, the winning West that, that he means uh, is something real, not, not an idea. And that real thing is a winning club and free, and as he says, sovereign nation state. And I'll get back to that. And at the kickoff, not here, but in Berlin, there was a speaker who uh, suggested to even abandon the term. Just get rid of it. It's old thinking, he said. Uh, and uh, it, it's the thinking of the East-West divide, the Cold War. That's uh, the West. So let's get rid of it. I think there was, uh, when you look at the speakers, something of a Munich consensus. And that consensus is that the current West is in crisis, and when you look at it, at it as a club, it lacks cohesion and the ability to, uh, increasingly the ability to project power and to create order. And then as an idea, it's in a, in a period of self-doubt. I think that is what the term Westlessness uh, in the Munich Security Report wanted to, uh, wanted to say. Uh, <clears throat> the question now is, is the West dead or is it winning? In order to, <clears throat> to answer that, I want to get Go, go back a little bit in history, there is uh, at, at, at least four concept, uh, concepts of what the West is. The one is the, uh, the West as a synonym for modern civilization, so a com community of highly developed and technologically leading nations. The second is the cultural West, a cultural community historically formed uh, through Christian or uh, Judeo-Christian heritage. The third concept is the concept of a racist, a white West, not a wild West, but a white West. Um, and the fourth, and only the fourth of these concepts is the political West, uh, a community of nations that have adopted liberal democracy. Uh, and the political West that we've come to know and uh, to grow up in is actually a young and an old concept at the, uh, at the same time. It is old in, in that it uh, goes back um, to, the, uh, uh, to the principles of the Enlightenment. In fact, you would say it's the, the, the attempt to translate uh, the Enlightenment into the political sphere, uh, found its first appearance on the world stage as a political concept in the American Revolution of 1776. Uh, the French in 17, I call them the transatlantic revolutions, uh, I'd also uh, mention the, uh, the Polish Constitution of 1791. So that's so the, the concept uh, uh, that comes with the birth of individual freedom uh, as, a, uh, as a concept, human dignity, rights of the individual, especially of minorities, rule of law, division of power, we, we know all of this, uh, electoral democracy. In that context, the, the, the ideas West uh, is, is an open West, not a geographic, it's not a location, uh, 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 but a concept and an idea. It's not a geographical term. Now, as, as practice, uh, uh, um, it's much younger. Um, one could say that 
the, the principle turns into institutions only in the post-war uh, in the post-war period, uh, the uh, the Atlantic Charter of uh, 41, Marshall Plan 47, Universal Declaration of Re uh, Human Rights uh, in, in 1948, Washington Treaty of uh, 1949. So those that would be the 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 the, the current uh, translation into our institutional framework that we've seen uh, post-war, uh, and and it is also worth remembering that. Uh, there is a difference between the post-war era and the post-1990 era. Uh, while these ideas were infused and, and, and led into institution, uh, they only dominated post-1990. So they are a product of American hegemony, of Pax Americana, uh, of the unilateral uh, moment, and they actually have found their, uh, their best expression, uh, I would say, in the Paris Charter of 1990, which incidentally this year we commemorate for the 30th year, was the last treaty, I think, the Soviet Union uh, before its demise uh, uh, signed. So are we in a moment where, uh, given the, uh, the, uh, the, the absence of hegemony uh, and the crisis uh, of the of the ideas West, are we in a moment where we have to say wither the West? Um, yes, hegemony is waning, but uh, I would just remind us that there was a West when there was no hegemony. Uh, uh, yes, global reach is reduced, but it was also during the Cold War. So th that is something that we're well used to. So hegemony, liberal hegemony is not the precondition of the existence of the West, in the absence of, of which is not the end uh, of the West. We just need to uh, remember that there was a, a West, a Warsaw Pact, and a G77 that incidentally consisted of 77 nations. So not, it's not as if the West sort of ran the world. Uh, that's uh, that, that's a, a, a memory uh, loss. I would even say that we have engaged in the last 30 years in, in something that I would call liberal overreach. Uh, it, it, sort of in the idea that everybody would have to become uh, and would inevitably become like us. Uh, I'd say that that's an element of post-1990 hubris. Uh, the idea of a missionary uh, uh, West. While the fact is that the existence of human rights uh, do not come with a right to regime change, although some, including some of us, may have conf uh, confused the two. Um, so what we actually need to do is to replace a missionary with an exemplary uh, uh, version of liberalism. And if you think about it that way, uh, uh, the absence of liberal hegemony is not a bad thing because it doesn't get you in trouble in, the, in, in, in that sense. So it's not just a loss of power, but it's, uh, it's probably uh, uh, something that will allow us to become more principled in the, in the first place. So what I'm advocating for here is a, 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 a more robust, because we'll need to defend the idea of the West, yet more tempered, uh, a liberalism. Uh, I, I call it robust liberalism. We also should not confuse uh, the, uh, in the institutions with the principles. So the demise of institutions does not mean, is not the same thing uh, as the, uh, the demise of principles. Uh, the, even if NATO collapsed tomorrow, it doesn't mean that the West, as an ideas West, collapses. Uh, the, the institutions, the post-war institutions that we formed, are a product of the post-war era. There needs to be adaption, there needs to be uh, a, a, ch a change, and that might even result in new institutions. It doesn't mean that the principles uh, are, are, are challenged or, or, uh, or in question. Um, so do not confuse institutions with the values would be uh, my claim, something of which I've heard uh, quite a bit during uh, this conference. For Germans, that is a especially difficult proposition because Germans tend to equate the institutions with the West. And that is because we became part of the West only in 1949. Um, 
uh, yes, uh, Germany was part of the creation of the West, just think Immanuel Kant during the Enlightenment, but it was also the country that fought the political consequences of the Enlightenment with tooth and nail like nobody else uh, until 1945. So for people in France, Britain, uh, the, the, the United States certainly, uh, the idea that the West is a, the, the brother, brotherhood of free nations with a changing a set of institutions is much more familiar than to Germans. I think that is why you see the German concern, and that is when you are here in, at, at, at MSC, uh, that's why the title is here. That's why the German concern is translated so much into this, uh, into this agenda. I think, and uh, two for, uh, final ideas before I turn it over to, uh, to Ivan, I think what we are in is a battle, is not the demise of the West, but we are in a battle for the soul of the West which is a different thing. And that is, and I think you saw it on stage yesterday, uh, there is the liberal ideas West versus the sovereignist nationalist uh, uh, West that wants to form a culture club to uh, defend the, uh, the West against the others. Uh, and that is the West that some see winning. But that's a very different West. And uh, uh, to some that winning to some Westerners, that winning is even a concern. And I would say if Trump is re-elected, we'll see more of that. We will see the emergence of a, of a culture club alliance that will then call, be called the West. I think, I think we see the emergence of that in the internationalist, in the uh, sort of the national internationalist uh, alliance is, is the starting point uh, of this. So we'll see that at warp speed, I think, after uh, re-election. So what to do about it? Three mini points. Uh, first, address uh, uh, the crisis of trust within our uh, 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 Western societies. Uh, I, I think in terms of the foreign policy, the idea of a more temperate, more exemplary liberalism would be a good starting point. The second uh, uh, point I have very little to contribute to. For the first time, the West is con confronted with a uh, with a um, with an authoritarian uh, environment that is economically successful, something that we have had no experience with and have no idea how to deal with, and without having an, uh, an idea how we can increase our output legitimacy, uh, 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 I don't see how that can be done, and I don't think anybody has ideas yet on how that to be done, and certainly I, I don't, but it is a, a key component. And my third point about what not to do is to confuse the Western problem in the following way, and I, you can see that around every corner as well, which is to, to, to hallucinate that there is a European answer to an American problem. What we see in front of us is a Western problem and a Western challenge uh, that, uh, that can only have an inner Western resolution, and that, by the way, includes an American resolution in, Ma in America being part of whatever a new balance uh, of liberal uh, democracies might look like. So European sovereignty as an idea to me is a mimicry of the problem and not a, 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 not a solution. And in an odd way, uh, the crisis of the West uh, is proof of the cohesion of the West. Uh, it's because we all have the same crisis and nobody else has that crisis. It, it shows that we indeed are the West. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll also try to be very brief so we can have. And uh, I also decided to, to, base, to basically make my presentation on the basis of what I have heard. But what I have heard was very much uh, influenced me by a book that I have read and I do believe you should credit me for the fact that I'm going to basically praise somebody else's books, not my own. Uh, and this is a very, uh, this is a great uh, historical book which was just published last year by a famous American Stanford professor in Cold War history, Newmark, which is called Stalin and the Fate of Europe. And this just deals with the period 1944-1949. And this is an amazing book, in fact. First, I'm saying this because to a great extent listening to the 5G debate, which we're seeing here and obviously we're going to see in many places, it reminds me very much for the Marshall Plan debate. With the risk that the Americans can be in the position of the Soviets basically telling their allies 
to get out of something. And uh, uh, secondly, what is very important is in these books, he shows something that I do believe we have forgotten. Now we talk about the interdependence. Do you remember how interdependent the West and the Soviet Union was in the 1940s, where they have been governing some of the major European cities together? The famous Jeep in Vienna, in which you have one of the all great power, basically soldiers staying together. I'm saying this because I do believe from this point of view, it's quite important also, the book is based on cases and showing how a small countries have in a certain way, much more shaped their own debate than we expect in the type of political polarization. So he has a chapter on Finland, on Albania, on Yugoslavia, on Denmark, and suddenly places that you believe that does not have any kind of a sovereignty to do anything, have been quite effective in solving some of their problems in this very initial period. Why I'm saying this? Like many people, I believe that the conflict between the United States and China is going to shape very much what is going to happen. And it's going to be big, and obviously, what we heard on the conference, if there is one thing on which uh, the Democrats and the Republicans are not divided uh, in the United States, this is on China. And I mean, the, the Speaker Pelosi was very clear on this. Uh, uh, so, secondly, I don't believe that this is a return to the Cold War, and this is for me, probably it's obvious for everybody, but I don't know why I want to repeat it. Soviet communism was not authoritarianism. Soviet communism was a universalist project, very much based in the European Enlightenment, which had the claim on the future as a whole, and from this point of view, it was not about governing the world, it was about transforming the world. And from this point of view, it was a very special type of an alternative to the Western liberal project, which is also very much universalist project, and this is very much about transforming the world. From this point of view, to believe that the conflict between communism and democracy, and between democracy and authoritarianism, is the same conflict, in my view, is categorically mistaken. What is authoritarianism? This is basically regimes in the way in which people, in the way they don't choose their parents, do not choose their governments. And on the other side, the major definition of democracy, which political scientists are going to come with, is this is regimes in which government can lose elections. From this point of view, the, the fact that you're choosing your government first does not mean that you're going to choose one and the same type of a government, and also it does not mean that you very much like the government that you have chosen. Uh, I'm saying this because I do believe part of the problem with this West-China or America-China confrontation is that unlike the Soviet Union, China is not interested to basically populate the world with their replicas. They're interested in asymmetrical relationship with our powers, and their dominations from this point of view is not as clearly ideological as that we are claiming. Basically, making somebody dependent on your technology is totally different than what Chinese were doing in the 1970s, trying to create a communist party of the Chinese type, uh, for example, in Africa. Uh, and from this point of view, I'm going to my last point. How in this type of a confrontation, why Europe is reacting so differently to many of these issues? And my point is that if liberal order was important probably to all of the Western countries, for the European Union, the question is, can European Union survive in the absence of liberal order? To what extent you was preconditioned on liberal order? To what extent the idea of the interdependency and shared sovereignty and so on, which is at the heart of the European project, can survive if basically all others are going to go the other way? And from this point of view, the problem of uh, liberalism for the uh, European Union is not simply a geopolitical problem, this is an existential issue. How we're going to do it. And from this point of view, I do believe Europe is facing kind of a four choices in this case for different answers to this. One is what we heard from President Macron, and this is the idea of the European sovereignty, which means that the European Union should develop capabilities, basically particularly military capabilities, uh, in which to stay as a position of its own. You can like it or dislike it, how realistic or unrealistic it is, but basically this is one of the story. The other story, which if you go on the public opinion polls, you're going to see that unfortunately, probably, is the most preferred story by European publics is that this is the late Habsburg option. We want to preserve the liberal nature of the European Union, making all other parties to guarantee us that we can be as we are. Chinese, Americans, uh, uh, basically Russians. From this point of view, in the way the Habsburg basically survived for so many years, because suddenly all others 
found the reasons to believe that tolerating this was the most important. I do believe this, this is also the reason of President Macron talking about different relations with Russia, about the German Chancellor very much insisting that we should not make out of the 5G debate a Marshall Plan uh, uh, dividing debate and others. Uh, uh, and then, of course, there is the problem which also uh, was very much alerted uh, 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 coming from Thomas is you can have an American-led coalition which does not need to be a coalition based on very much shared values. If you go back and see the American coalition in the Latin America during the Cold War, you're not going to claim that most of the governments in this part of the world were particularly, there was a common enemy, and this common enemy was very much recognized by everybody, uh, but it does not mean that basically the United States have been sharing uh, much values with some of the countries that they had been supporting. And I do believe this is in a certain way, uh, 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 the, the, the challenge is that I'm going to end up on this, out of all players, which all of them, in my view, have their own problems, and in the 1970s, Pierre Asner has a term which I like a lot, calling it competitive decadence. He said, we are not doing fine, but the Soviets were not doing fine too after 1968, and the problem is who is going to basically <laughs> remain standing for a longer period of time. And I don't believe that China is overperforming, and I, I can risk to say that I'm not sure that Russia is overperforming, uh, and to say that we're overperforming is also going to be slightly an overstatement. Uh, so from this point of view, probably this could be also this competitive decadence issue, but only for the European Union, the problem of the liberal order is the problem of the survival of the Union, even in its territorial borders and others. And from this point of view, of course, uh, uh, the position of the United Kingdom also is going to be critical for us.